Chronicle of the Times Vintage Voices from 1875 Welcome to Chronicle of the Times and our new series, Vintage Voices. In today's episode, we take a spin of the papers from 1875, including what people are talking about, some of the major stories of the day, our agony aunt corner, this time from the Ladies' Journal, Vintage Victuals Recipes from the York Cookery School, Easy and Cheap. And this week our Advice Corner comes from Devon. The Tattletales Gossip Corner featuring some general news items. And we finish with some British and American gossip stories, all from the papers in 1875. We hope you enjoy the show. About 1875. We start this exploration with a quick review of some of the major news items of 1875. Jack the Ripper's emergence is some 13 years away. Captain Matthew Webb is the first officially recognised person to swim the English Channel some 40 miles in 21 hours and 40 minutes. The Zenith balloon launched in France reached the altitude of 8,600 metres, which is about 28,000 feet. Crochet, Spinelli and Civil die from breathing the thin air. Tisandia survived but remains deaf for the rest of his life. The age of consent is raised from 12 years to 13 years of age. William Morris releases a successful new wallpaper line. Queen Victoria continues to rule the UK. Benjamin Disraeli, the Earl of Beaconsfield, is Prime Minister. And in the United States, Ulysses S. Grant is President of the United States and Henry Parks is the Premier of New South Wales in Australia. In the United States, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits racial discrimination in public accommodations and jury duty. What people are talking about? The Wainwright crime. The horrific crime of Henry Wainwright, who initially buried the body of his ex-paramour, covering it in lime, then dug it up when he needed to sell his property and cut up the body into pieces, individually wrapping them up to be left at different locations around London. The attempted ravishings of Miss Dickinson by Colonel Baker, reaching some of the highest echelons of the social ladder, it was Incredible to think that a lone woman in a first-class carriage could be sexually attacked by a man who was good friends with the Prince of Wales and a distinguished soldier. The closing of the Titchbourne Claimant case. One of the longest court cases in legal history, the claimant Arthur Orton had tried to state that he was really the missing heir who had drowned near Australia come back to claim his inheritance and the Titchbourne baronessy. The Charles Bravo case. Everyone was discussing, did she or didn't she, in terms of her, by all accounts, brutal husband and his mysterious death. Agony Aunt Corner. The rules for personal advice were quite strict with this missive from the papers in front of many advice columns at the time. Notice to correspondents. We cannot undertake to reply to correspondence by letter. All ladies wishing their questions answered must use signatures of an unobjectionable kind. We decline to answer any 
who adopt either vulgar or slang signatures. With that in mind, the following range of responses to letters we do not get to see come mainly from the ladies' journal. To Harry's little puss, a young lady should not correspond with a gentleman, nor send a photograph of herself, not even at his request, unless she is engaged to him. To a distressed aunt, marriage by register is as legal as any other form of marriage. To stupid little Miss Curiosity, it is not at all the custom, and never has been, for a lady to kiss a gentleman under the mistletoe. The following is the origin. It was customary in olden times for the rich and noble to treat their dependents at Christmas and to meet them on terms of equality, considering that all men are we guarded alike by the religion of him whose natal day they're celebrating. A sort of license prevailed. Therefore, a branch of mistletoe was hung in the hall or doorway, and all the youths of all the classes were understood to have a right to kiss any maiden whom they could inveigle under it. To forget me not. Had you asked advice before your engagement, we should have endeavoured to dissuade you from marrying one to whom religion appears distasteful. But now your marriage is about to take place, you should let him know now and at once how far above all earthly affection is the love of Jesus, the Redeemer, and that it will be a sore trial for you if you do not have him, your husband, accompanying you to church on Sunday. To Darkness we think that a past engagement of nine years and a future one lasting two or three more is calculated to try the affections of any man or woman. Under the circumstances, you had better give him his freedom, however hard it may be for you. But if he is an upright man, he should prefer to keep his promise to you as you have given him your youth and patience waiting. To perplexed girl, if you intend to become his wife, we see no objection, as he has every right to ask you to improve yourself before and after marriage. To freckly face, we are sorry to hear that you have any brothers so ill-bred and unmanly as to comment on your personal defects. Try never to mind. There is no cure for freckles except to shut yourselves up in a box. It is caused by the rusting of the skin. Advice Corner This episode's general advice for 1875 comes from the North Devon Journal, the 30th of December 1875, Family Recipes. For repairing family jars, mutual love, stirred with forbearance, mixed with readiness to forgive, and generally good temper, is an admirable cement. It is well to let all family jars to be shelved at once, preserving. The temper is best kept by using as little vinegar as possible. Pickles. Those persons in to them most who meddle with other people's business or who act on the rule of policy rather than that of straightforward truth and unswerving honesty. To cure cold and heartburn, do all the good you can. Love your neighbour as yourself. Tart. Some think tart replies to be smart, but it is never wise to let our wit wound other persons' feelings. Tart speeches lead to general sourness. Vintage Victual Recipes In today's episode, Goulding's Practical Farmer offers these two recipes. Sweet Apples 
This is a very good way of treating apples. Stew them in a porcelain kettle with just enough molasses and water to prevent burning until cooked, and then transfer them to the oven with all the liquid residue. This gives a baked apple half jellied delicious in flavour and moisture. Plain rice pudding. One quart of milk, half a teaspoon of rice, two teaspoons of sugar, half a nutmeg grounded, and a small piece of butter. Pick and wash the rice. Add all the ingredients. Stir it all well together and put it in a slack, a low oven, for one and a half to two hours. When done, pour it in a pudding dish and serve when cold. And from the York School of Cookery, these recipes are recommended for those on a budget. Economist's Pudding Half a pint of boiling milk poured upon one pound of pieces of stale cake broken up and add one quarter a pound of currants. Beat up four eggs and put it into the mixture. Mix it all well. Butter a mould, adding some pieces of candied peel or dried fruit. Put the pudding into the mould, lay a paper over it and steam it for three quarters of an hour. Cauliflower fritters. Soak cauliflower in salt and water. Parboil till tender. Drain and cut up. Make a batter of one quarter pound of flour and yolks of two eggs. Mix smooth. Take the whites of the eggs, whisk well, and add to the flour and yolks with a little beer or water. Dip the cauliflower in this mixture and fry in boiling fat. Tattle Tales Gossip Corner. In this segment, we take a look at some of the news articles of the day that caused a stir at the time to be discussed with family, friends and neighbours over a cup of tea. To start with, this sad tale given as a warning to all married men. From the Carlo Sentinel on the 4th of September 1875, death preferred to a mother-in-law. On Friday morning, a man, 30 years of age, a plate layer on the Settle and Carlisle Railway, hanged himself on a post in a public ground at Carlisle. Before doing so, he wrote with a piece of chalk on a neighbouring wall the following message. I take the pleasure of writing these few lines, if it will be warning to all young men and never live with a mother-in-law. Now I end my miserable life. News from America. Abraham Lincoln was a bit of a hero to the British. This story made quite a few of the papers. From the Carlo Sentinel, the 4th of September, 1875. The Insanity of Mrs. Abraham Lincoln. Mrs. Abraham Lincoln is given up as hopelessly insane. She sits down silent and alone in her solitary room to keep imaginary company with senators and ambassadors in the light of that graciously kind smile long since hidden beneath the coffin lid. It is one of the mercies vouchsafed her to live her life over again with her loved ones, dear little Willie and rollicking boyish Ted, to sit at the head of the table and hold familiar conversations with them all. The British were fascinated by the American tycoons, of which there seemed to be loads of in Victorian times. Stories of inner family turbulence in these rich families only added to the salaciousness of the story. From the Courier and West End Advertiser, the 16th of October, 1875. Spiritualism Extraordinary. 
a will contest on a grand scale, which promises, says the Manchester Examiner, to prove as attractive to the American public as the Beecher Tilton case, and threatens to last almost as long, and it has been commenced in the circuit court at Detroit. This will is that of Captain E. B. Ward, described as the leading millionaire and capitalist of Michigan and the foremost businessman in Detroit. He left five adult children by a wife from whom he had been divorced, two of whom are lunatics, and his other relatives include a young widow to whom he was married after his divorce and who has two children. To his second wife and her children, he left property worth two million dollars and the residue of his estate. He bequeathed to his other children, subject, however, to the permanent administration of various executors named by him, this provision being plainly dictated by the idea that none of the children were capable of managing property. The will was disputed by the offspring of the first marriage, and the grounds of their objections are certainly comprehensive. They accuse their father of insane tendencies, produce the family genealogy, and give a formidable list of idiots and lunatics amongst his relations and in his own family. In support of the allegation of lunacy, and also as a separate argument against the soundness of the will, they allege that he was a spiritualist and had drawn up his will under the influence, as he believed, of spiritual dictation. The council promised to prove that Captain Ward bought and sold property because spirits told him to, that he consulted them in important lawsuits, that he sent out expedition after expedition in search of silver on the advice of these spirits, judged of men's honesty in the same manner, supported mediums for his private use in business matters, drove one of his sons to suicide by charging him with immorality on the strength of some spiritualistic declaration, that his resistance to Senator Chandler's re-election was due to information from mediums that the senator's mind had failed, and that the present will was made under pretended instructions from the spirit of his last wife's father. A long array of prominent mediums were to give evidence in support of these pleas, but an objection was made on the ground that a belief in spiritualism was no more proof of insanity than any other form of religious belief would be, and this point had not been decided in the report from which we quote. Our last story of 1875 is the huge scandal of the Reverend Thomas Morris Hughes of Anglesey. Reverend Hughes is a married man with seven children and the lead curate of two parishes in Anglesey in North Wales. The good Reverend Thomas Hughes is in more than a bit of bother as he has been caught having a repeated affair with his 13-year-old stepdaughter. Producing a bastard child from the 13-year-old stepdaughter that dies from malnourishment, lying about the birth of the child, now considered a felony, lying about the death of the same child, also a felony, and all of the various immorality clauses that the above points to. Reverend Hughes has spent the day in Bangle attempting to explain away his transgressions and hold on to his livelihood. Upon coming home, he gets himself utterly inebriated 
with the women in the household scattering to the local alehouse, asking for refuge and help. The good reverend is seen to be beating and kicking the very child he has seduced as people from the alehouse come to try to help the girls in answer to their pleas for help. From the Derby Mercury, June the 9th, 1875, the Anglesey Clerical Scandal, Extraordinary Proceedings. On Thursday at Beaumaris, the Reverend Thomas Morris Hughes, stipendiary curate of Clandewen in Anglesey, was brought up in custody before Mr. Massey, a county magistrate, having been arrested at three o'clock that morning, charged with drunken and riotous conduct and with assault. The accused was undefended. Margaret Parry, landlady of the Boston Arms Alehouse in Clandaniel, stated that on Wednesday evening, defendant having arrived home the same evening from Bangor, where a commission of inquiry directed by the Bishop of Bangor had been that day holding an investigation into charges of immorality against him. Mrs. Hughes, the defendant, Reverend Hughes's wife, came to request her to go to the parsonage. The door was locked, but the Reverend Hughes admitted the witness, and she heard him have a few words with his stepdaughters, Miss Emma Alice and Miss Mildred Hamer. Witness then left, but presently Miss Emma Hamer came to the Boston Arms and was followed by Miss Mildred. Both asked to be allowed to remain there for refuge during the night, and so did Mrs. Hughes, the Reverend Hughes's wife. Griffith Parry, husband of the witness, said that at ten o'clock, in consequence of requests from members of defendant's family, he went to the parsonage and was called in to protect Miss Hamer, whom Reverend Hughes was beating. Reverend Hughes took hold of her by the hair, and struck her. The witness, Griffith Parry, took hold of Reverend Hughes and tried to persuade him to be quiet. Reverend Hughes peremptorily ordered him out of the house, opened the door for him, and challenged him to fight. Witness and his wife went home to their alehouse, and in about five minutes, Miss Emma Hamer came there and begged he would go and fetch someone to proceed with him to the parsonage. Witness aroused a man named John Williams, and returning to the Boston Arms, found the defendant, Reverend Hughes, and all his family there. Directly afterwards, the defendant, Reverend Hughes, commenced to beat the ladies, and he kicked Mrs. Hughes, his wife, and Miss Emma, his stepdaughter, four or five times. They called upon the parry to protect them. He did so, but defendant seized him by the beard and plucked a handful out. He and Williams were not able to restrain the, the defendant, Reverend Hughes, and a police constable was sent for, who took him in charge. An intimation was given by one of the defendant's bondsmen under the criminal charge already pending that he intended to withdraw his surety and, the police having applied for a remand till Saturday, it was granted, bail being refused. The Imprisonment of the Reverend Mr. Hughes On Saturday, the magistrates at Boundaries were occupied several hours in hearing the charges against the Reverend Thomas Morris Hughes, clerk in Holy Orders, who was brought up in custody under five distinct charges. The prosecutor was Inspector Joseph Parry of the Anglesey Constabulary, and the defendant, Reverend Hughes, was charged with committing an aggravated assault upon his stepdaughter, Miss Emma Alice Hamer, with being drunk and riotous, and with being on licensed promises at illegal hours with assaulting the landlord of a public house 
while acting as constable in his own house and with assaulting one John Williams when called upon to assist the landlord. Margaret Parry, wife of Griffith Parry, the landlord of the Boston Arms, deposed to going on Wednesday evening last at the request of Mrs. Hughes, the defendant's wife, to Lord Daniel Parsonage after closing the Boston Arms. Witness, having again been sent for, went with her husband to the Parsonage and upon returning home, Miss Emma followed her and was given permission to remain at the Boston Arms all night. Miss Mildred Hamer, the eldest stepdaughter, afterwards came, and then the defendant, Reverend Hughes, and Mrs. Hughes. She believed Reverend Hughes was under the influence of drink. He asked the young ladies to go home, but they declined as they were afraid of him. Griffith Parry, husband of the last witness, deposed that when he and his wife went to the parsonage, he saw the defendant, Reverend Hughes, beat Miss Hamer. Reverend Hughes had hold of her hair and struck her, but witness could not say whether his hand was closed. He appeared to be kicking her. She was crying out, and witness laid hold of defendant and asked him to desist. Reverend Hughes turned round and ordered Witness out, and when Witness got on the doorstep, challenged him to a fight. Witness and his wife then returned home. Miss Emma came there directly, and at her request, Witness got the assistance of John Williams. Soon after midnight, the defendant and his whole family were assembled in a back parlour at the Boston Arms. In a few minutes all the ladies were heard screaming, and upon witness going into the room with Williams, the ladies asked them to afford them protection. The defendant, Reverend Hughes, shook Miss Hamer, and she slapped him in return. Directly Williams made his appearance. The defendant struck him in the breast several times. They were called in to restrain the defendant, and on one of these occasions, whilst the defendant, Reverend Hughes, was lugging one of the ladies about rather harshly, he caught witness who interfered by his whiskers and dragged off a quantity of hair. Witness, at the request of Mrs. Hughes, about two o'clock on Thursday morning, sent for a policeman. The defendant, Reverend Hughes, was not sober and he was disorderly, his language was rather vulgar, and he cursed a bit. He threatened to thrash Witness and Williams and challenged them both, saying he would take them both together or the best man in the village. John Williams, a farmer, gave corroborative evidence. When Witness came into the room, the defendant demanded his business there and struck him in the breast. Miss Hamer told Parry and himself to beware that the defendant had a knife. Reverend Hughes acted more like a madman than a man in drink. Robert Williams, Boston House, Clandaniel, deposed that he heard from inside the parsonage cries of murder in a female voice. Miss Mildred Hamer was then outside and she got opposite the kitchen window. The defendant who was inside, threw a large missile at her, missing a window, but she avoided it. The defendant threatened to strike witness and swore at Police Constable Evans, who took the defendant in charge, stated that his face and hands were partly covered with blood, and his coat had blood upon it. Miss Hamer's skirt was also bloody. Mr. Jones, in defence, submitted that some of the charges were not proved, but the defendant had been so worried lately that he became nervously excited and was not accountable for his act. He called Miss Mildred Hamer, who positively denied that any assault had been committed on either herself or her sister Emma. The magistrate, after deliberating in private,
came to the decision that all charges were proved and sentenced the defendant to three months' imprisonment without hard labour. We end this episode with an appeal for funds to the poor Dublin cabmen, or cabbies, looking for some shelter. From the Freeman's Journal, the 11th of September, 1875, wanted £100. We want £100 to build a cabman's shelter in Dublin. We have never yet appealed in vain to our fellow citizens for subscriptions towards any deserving object. This is a most deserving one. We know we shall now not appeal in vain. Many complaints have been made of the condition of Dublin cabs and Dublin cab drivers. Let us help to improve both by providing for the men some shelter from the weather, some place to rest and get a cup of tea or coffee during the long hours of their toil. Nearly all the great cities in England have these shelters and they have proved eminently successful and beneficial alike to the cabmen and the public. Many of our readers are familiar with the pretty structure on the Strand near St Clement's Church in London and other similar shelters there and elsewhere. We have made inquiries and have received particulars as to them. A good shelter costs about £80. That concludes this episode of Chronicle of the Times, Vintage Voices from 1875. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. Please do let us know what you think in the comments. We are looking to improve this series and we're open to suggestions of what you like and what you don't like. If you did enjoy the show, we would be so grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. We upload three days a week. Tuesdays is our Vintage Voices series, including an Agony Aunt section, a Recipe section, and the Gossip of the Day. Thursdays is an episode looking at the lighter sides of Georgian, Victorian, and Edwardian times. And Sundays, with a recounting of stories by authors such as Dickens, Munro, Conan Doyle, M. R. James, and Wilkie Collins. If you like this channel, you may like our sister channel, News of the Times, which looks at crime stories from the past. From all of us here at Chronicle of the Times, thank you for watching, liking, and subscribing. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I. I'm Robin Coles.